remember, when you create a table, a table header is put on every AMP. Then, when they begin to load the data, each AMP literally opens at a minimum a 512 byte sector. It's like you have a little wallet. And then they load that up. And then they put two wallets together and they load that up. And then they add another sector to that and they load that up. And this block continues to grow until it's about the size of a briefcase. And then it grows until it's the size of a suitcase at about one megabyte. That's the maximum block size. And then and only then will it split. I love to teach you and get you the fundamentals so you clearly see things. And then I take you deeper and deeper and deeper. We're going deep. Take a look at this. We already see that we have a cylinder. It's got so many colored rows here. And of course, we know how the row reference array works. It's going to map the starting position of every one of these rows. Now, in front of our rows, I want you to once again see that we have the row length. Then, the row ID, then we have the flag byte. All this tells Teradata is, is this a normal table or a partitioned primary index table? If it's a zero, it's a normal table. If it's not, it's a partitioned primary index table. And then we have the presence byte. This will let this row know if there are null values in any of these columns. We'll learn more about that as time goes on. That's what's in front of every single row. Having large block sizes is fantastic when you have to analyze every row because you're bringing it all in, thousands of rows in at a time. But if you're going to do inserts or updates, single row things, you usually like smaller blocks. We know in Teradata that we can go up now in v14.10 up to a megabyte before there's any splitting, but they have certain defaults based on the system size. For example, if you have a large system, an enterprise system, like a 6700, then you're going to have a default of about 512k before it splits. Then you can say, hey, wait, I want it to be the maximum of a meg, but by default, when the system is set up, if nothing is done at 512K, it's going to split. And on the smaller systems, that's cut in half to 256K when it'll split. Again, you could say, nope, I want it to be a megabyte. But by default, as you can see, based on system size, you'll have block splits at different levels. Each amp has a master index that is always in its FSG cache. That master index tells that AMP where it is placed, all of its data in all of its tables. Let's take another look at this. Notice here we've got the blue table. It's in one cylinder. The red table's in a cylinder. Ooh, we have got the order table in green in two different cylinders. We can see that it's split and there's four blocks in total. But I want you to notice this last cylinder here. There are many tables in that one cylinder. And as soon as an AMP is told, you go query this table. It always looks in the master index and calls down to that disk. I need cylinder number four. Get it. That's the way it's going to work. Without any DBA intervention, data is loaded in these blocks and it splits. Take a look at this. We can see that we actually have one table here with six blocks in it. Notice the table header and the trailer is in everything. There's a row reference array in everything. And we've got our rows there in row ID order. And the AMP looking in the master index would be able to see these very clearly. That's the way it works. When these blocks split, they are still in order. And what's so clever about this is once they know the row hash of something that they're looking for, the parsing engine will say, hey, that row is on this amp. And the amp is only going to bring in one of these blocks because the master index really tells it the beginning row hash and the ending row hash in that block 
So, even though this table on this AMP has split into six blocks, the minute you give a primary index in the WHERE clause, they know which AMP and they know which data block. Brilliant.